How you doing everybody? It's Jay Nan to San Antonio Metal Music Examiner with Access.com with a gentleman you know very well from his white line days, but tonight he is here at the Corova downtown San Antonio doing a very special solo acoustic gig as part of a nationwide or actually North American tour. Say hello and welcome Mr. Mike Tramp. How you doing sir? Thank you Jay. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. Welcome to San Antonio. I know, uh, wow, well, let's let's start from there. I know you are on a full-blown tour. Like I said, it's not just a couple shows here and there. Uh, this is 46 yeah. shows across the, the U.S. nation. And we are, and then, yeah. We're definitely glad to have you here. Um, when was the last time, just starting off? Yeah, you know what? You started something, like I said, as you said, talking about that, I was start thinking in my head, hmm, when is the last time we were here? And stuff like that. And, and it's a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. And... Uh, they started building some new freeways around here and everything was uh, very nice and stuff like that. So, um, you know what, I'm just, I'm just grateful to still be given the opportunity to go out there and, and, and perform. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I feel like I've evolved that what I do sort of today, regardless if I represent a bit of the past in my, in my, on my set list or, or, or whatever you have, or, you know, it's just that this is what I do. I play music, and and it's great to know that there are still people that that likes to to hear what I do, and and have also have grown with my recent albums and follow and understand where I am in my life at, at this time. And in, 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 uh, and you know, I think it's a lot of people may not know that you actually have more solo albums nowadays than what White Line. Yeah, albums. I mean, we, we all, we, of course, we understand. <laughs> you know, you know. Sometimes you're known for the single mistake you made and not all the success you have or whatever. Yeah, I mean, White Line recorded four albums from the period of 1984 to 1990 and broke up in 91. And um, after that, I had a band called Freak of Nature. We did three albums. And, and since then, I've basically been, uh, been just working on myself and, and I'm up on, on, you know, on 10 solo albums. Right. It's amazing, and uh, yeah, I think you, Museum was released last year. Yeah, you've got a new one coming out. What in August? Yeah, and, and so I mean, so right now America is the end of the tour, so this is where I finished the Museum tour. Okay, uh, because it started in Europe and Asia last year in August, and now it's coming to America. So as I'm finishing the American tour on June 13, I travel back to Europe, which of, of course is where Rachel I was born and raised. Um, and then late August, the new album comes out, and then I start with a new, new concept and set and stuff like that. Well, that's just the perfect excuse for you to come back a second yeah, time. Yeah, no, no. I mean, <laughs> it's it's just that you know it started in Europe, so it finishes in America, and then starts again in Europe and finishes in America and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, what can you tell us about the forthcoming record before we get into all the past and everything that's going on tonight? Well, I mean, for those that are sort of new to, to the, the whole thing about my tramp, you know, solo or the word acoustic is that, you know, in 2012, I went into my friend's recording studio and said, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I was sort of just standing in the middle of the crossroads, not really knowing where I was going, right. left, right, forth, or back. And, you know, I says, and, you know, after a long talk, he says, you know, we always, whenever we do an album together, rock album, stuff like that, we always sit at the end of the day, you know, playing Johnny Cash or old Dylan and stuff like that. And, you'll, you know, I already know that, that your songwriting comes from that foundation. He says, why don't you just go in and just sit down with the guitar and the vocal and just play the songs the way they were written? Instead of going in and saying, this is how the song was written, but this is how it's going to be once the electric guitars and the drums and the bass are on. And so I, I went in there, and at the end of that day, you know, the first four tracks on the first solo album of what I call my trilogy of a sort of coming back from the, uh, the crossroads. Mm -hmm. First album was called Cobblestone Street. And so one thing led to another. After the week was done, the album was, was done and stuff like that, and I'm not even planning to do an album. And then I said to myself, now what would happen if I went out and played like that? So I put kind of like a presentable email together and sent it out to a good amount of European promoters that I knew and venues. And the response were really positive coming back. So I ended up going out touring before the album was ever released. And then the album came out and then I toured again and then I ended up going to America. And then the blueprint was kind of done. Then I came back, recorded the new album, Museum, and did the same thing over again. And now, 
I've just recorded the new album before I did the American tour, and now I do the American tour and I go back to Europe and, 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 and start over again. <laughs> and, and then at the same time, those three albums have just again had a natural evolution. So, where the two first albums, two first albums, doesn't sound right, but Cobblestone Street to Museum, there's a natural growth there. That's two or three steps up the ladder. From Museum to Nomad, which is a new album that will come out later, is a full band album. Okay. And that's simply just something that after playing acoustic for like four years and things like that, I'm all touring acoustic, I'm recording acoustic, I just felt that the next album needed to have the full band behind. I mean, it's not a, a it's not a return to the '80s or anything like that. It's it's a very, very together adult kind of album sure. sounding. You know, um, more in, in 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 the kind of Tom Petty, Neil Young, Ryan Adams kind of vibe. Yeah. But it screams Mike Tramp when you hear it. So it's it's you know. So musically. It's sort of very satisfying, you know, that what I do is exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Of course, the industry is almost non-existent, you know. So, you know, you, you, you sort of know you're going in and doing a record you you call a killer record, but you also know by the time it's pressed up, it's limited in what you can do with right. it. Right. Which is why I'm taking the music to the people. I go out there and play for sometimes anywhere from an hour and a half to three and a half hours. And then after the show, I go out and sell my albums and my t-shirts and, you know, take pictures and shake hands and do hugs with the people. And it's all just how it all has evolved into. Maybe we'll be lucky enough to get the three and a half hour set tonight. <laughs> yeah, but they better get me on stage a little earlier <laughs> on and things like that. You but know. without giving a whole set of, a whole lot away, you've got many, many shows coming up forthcoming after tonight. So, is yeah, I need you some tomorrow. Well, you, yeah, you mentioned that your new album has got a full band. You're doing, but on tour, you're on the solo acoustic yeah, thing. Yeah, so, it, whatever you want to say about it, is it more of a greatest hits thing? Is it a mix of everything? Oh, it's definitely it? a mix of everything. It's a mix of everything. You know, you know, want to play some of the old White Lion songs and and and, and reintroduce them to people in in many ways in the ways that were written. Because mm -hmm. right. my songwriting format has never changed through almost 38 years. It comes from the acoustic guitar format. I was raised on Dylan and Roy Orbison and Elvis and, and I was kind of like a campfire guitar player that sat around and, introdu and, and it, uh, uh, entertained my classmates and when we had trips with the school or the youth club and stuff like that. And somehow I've just taken that format and just made it a little bit more pro. And that, in many ways, without patting myself on the back or saying too much about anybody else, I feel that when I'm up there with the acoustic guitar, that is what I'm doing. This is not somebody from a rock band who's taking a break or waiting for the band to reunite right. and then just staying there. I'm just going out to make some cash and playing acoustic guitar. I feel I'm putting a little bit more into it and I've spent a lot of time arranging these songs so they will work in this format that people basically will walk away from that knowing that that's how those songs were written. Well, of course, obviously everybody knows, knows you from Wait, Tell Me, When the Children Cry, all the MTV hits. I personally gravitated towards, of course I love those songs too, but I gravitated towards the heavier stuff like Hungry, Lights and Thunder, Lady of the Valley. I mean, it may not even be hard, it's hard to measure just how well written and how many awesome songs you guys had back in the day, never mind the commercial stuff, just totally as a band. Are you, obviously, outside of the exception of maybe Metallica and Iron Maiden, every band from that era wishes they made it bigger, are you happy with White Line's place in metal or rock music during that time and just where you're at right now? Well, I'm happy with where I stand um, and I'm confident and I'm also very realistic and, and not bitter in any form of matter that, uh, oh, I wish we were still here and stuff like that. I follow that natural evolution and progression that waking up one day and just feeling, hmm, I need to do something else or, or move on 
come from that. Um, I do at times feel like, please don't throw all of, of these bands in a box and call it hair bands. Right. Because like you just mentioned, Lady in the Valley and Lights of Thunder, a hungry does not sound of hair. Right. Um, and, and you know, I do feel that even though if you went through a service magazine really quickly in the 80s, there's a good chance you would think that it was just one band in there. When you listen to the albums, I do feel that White Lion stands by itself up against Poison, Rad, um, Warned, or any of the other bands that we have our unique place and the songwriting of Vito Ryan and myself and my lyrics and things like that, I think from, from an early, early start, we're clear that we were not following the traditional glam and, and, and none sort of responsible in the lyrics in the way, I mean, I'm European and, and I always have a difficulty writing the TNA songs and things like that. It was never something I was very good at and, and therefore it is m such a small amount on, on, on the four white line albums that that issue right. even exists. Well, you mentioned Vito, and of course, obviously, it's, it's always an obligatory question of just people's natural curiosity. I saw the picture the other day where you apparently reunited temporarily with Greg <laughs> D'Angelo, the drummer from White Line. So, but I had a couple of questions from uh, so my social media readers, and of course, that was obviously on my mind, but also Renee from San Antonio wanted to know um, your most recent contact with Vito, and I'll just go ahead and say we found out that you've recently connected with Greg even temporarily. Have you had any recent con uh, contact with Vito and James Lomenzo? Well, I mean, James and I um, has been friends and, and no changes since the split or whatever, mm -hmm. things like that. There were some years where Vito and I were not, you know, in contact with each other. And then there were a couple of years when I touched on a sort of new version of White Lion, which I, of course, sort of regret, where he then came back with his lawyers and, and haunted me and stuff like that. And then there's sort of been, you know, the calm after the storm where we have been able to, to have some conversations that didn't necessarily were about why lion or, or, or even, even ever discussing the issue of a reunion right. because we and I have never even discussed that. And I'm almost, I'm almost positive that an incident tell you that it, it's something that will never happen. But not not so much as I wasn't even asking from a reunion standpoint. Just basically, like, when was your last contact? You yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a few months ago. A few months ago, we talked about acoustic guitars and things like that, and and you know it was it was pleasurable, and and I started understanding a little bit more, bit by bit about his stand. That you know, you know, if that's how he feels, uh -huh. that he doesn't really want to talk to anyone or do any interviews or anything like this and this and this and this, then that's not what he wants to do. Because I think what comes to mind, at least from my standpoint, is I would, in that sense, I would kind of equate him with Jakey Lee, just immensely talented guitarist who, for lack of a better phrase, disappeared off the face of the earth for 20 years or so. The only difference being Jake has finally come back in his band, Red Dragon Cartel. Nobody still knows what Vito has done. Obviously, you're the most qualified to, to, to know about yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you, all you got to do, all you got to do is just you know search the net, and you'll find out that all Vito has all Vito has done, without taking anything away from him, is in, in 25 years has done one interview with the a trunk, you know, on, on that you know on his rock show, and it sometimes puts me in a little bit of a difficult situation because obviously I get tired of it. I get tired of being the only source to answer any sure. the questions. Right. And at times, of course, I cannot help myself joking a little about it and joking a little bit about it on stage at times and telling some stories and stuff like that. There's no, there's nothing bad in, in, in you know, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, personally, I do wish that a man that has inspired that many guitar players and been co-writing that many great songs would have maybe a little bit more maybe respect for the fans at least to let them know you know i'm still alive and that, we can, <laughs> that people care about you yeah you know i mean it's just one of those things but you know ah, we're we're a unique phenomenon this 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 business of, of, of rock and roll and stuff like that and 
you know, you can't really call everybody very stable and things right. like that. So, well, you mentioned the resurgent version of White Line that was what around two thousand eight or so that you tried coming back with. Yeah, two thousand um, to eight. Yeah. Just give me a sense of what you know what your line of thinking was at that point mm -hmm. and the type of feedback you were getting if people didn't know if people thought White Line had disappeared back in the early nineties or mid nineties after main attraction. Mike came back with another version of White Line around 2008 or so, where Mike was the only original member. I'm not even sure how long that lasted, but what was your line of thinking back then? And you said you regret it. No. I, yeah, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? I I'll take I'll take I'll take all the blame because of course, you know, it wasn't so much that I was pushed into it. I mean, I still I could still have said no. And you know, it's one of those after my first three solo albums. Um, and putting my faith in managers and agents and record companies and, and that already would were, were, were just a 10% of what, what the big things have been. And uh, then suddenly somebody opens the door and says, ah, you know, if, if, you know, if you put a new version of White Lion together, of course, already at that time known that Vito was never going to do it or stuff like that, man, you'd be playing festivals and stuff like that. And then... You know, bit by bit, you sit and went, oh, well, I'm playing in a club for 35 people, and here's a festival with 35,000 people, and there's two more zeros behind the fee. And, and you know, all those little things play a part in it. And then the, another interesting thing is that what's the first thing that do? Rearrange the songs. <laughs> you know, then I put a new white line together, and I'm, I, I don't even try to go out there and reproduce the sound, I instantly try to, to sort of, you know, change the songs a bit, rearrange them, change things I didn't like. So in, in many ways, it defeats the whole point of going back out there to cash in on the name White Lion. When then at the end, I, you know, I write a new album called The Return of the Pride. And the concept is 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 a good idea. I even go as close to have resemblance of the album cover. But the music doesn't sound anything like it. And and one of the one of the reasons that is because I cannot commit to what I once was. I'm already moving forward, but under the banner of White Lion. Right. So I'm contradicting my own idea along the way and, and, and just, you know. But I give, you, I give you credit for that because apparently in your situation, you knew when something didn't feel right and you called it quits and you're like, hey, I'm going off solo, Mike Tramp, I still have my name. Whereas you could have very easily added your name to the list of the 80s bands out there that we do love where nowadays there's two versions of them. Yeah. You never want to see two versions of a band. No, so, no. so you totally steered away from that. Which no, I mean, I... Get, I, 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 I that's why I'm saying, hey, you know, I don't mind sitting and taking the blame. I don't mind sitting and admitting. It never felt right. Hey, listen, you know, me and, 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 and the four guys that, that, you know, I did a keyboard player, we traveled the world. We did the first South American white line to, a, to huge success. We played India for 100,000 people. We played Indonesia for 500,000 people. Um, we did things, that, but, you know, by the time we got to the airport, we couldn't use it for anything. <laughs> And we made some money, but we couldn't use it for anything. It would, it didn't feel real. And one of the reasons it didn't feel real is because Mike Tramp, in reality, didn't commit to it. He didn't really believe it. He was sort of just going through the motions. And the second I called it quits, and the second I returned to my original plan, which I started in '96 after Freak of Nature had ended, that's when I started breathing again. Well, as I mentioned, just. All the hits you guys have had and all the great albums you put out, I mean, I've got my personal favorites and hell, a lot of people may not even know because they know that Wait was the first video on MTV Airplay you got. A lot of people who even say that they're White Line fans may not even know the Fight to Survive was actually the first album. We don't Three want to years prior. Yeah, we don't want to forget that right Yeah, yeah, I great, great stuff. But, uh, and I remember because you guys came out during my high school years and I still remember to this day my buddy saying, hey man, when I get married, till death do us part is going to be played at our wedding. I had too many. So there's a lot of meaningful songs you guys have put out. Generic question here, but do you have a personal favorite or couple favorite songs and or White Line album 
that sticks with you the most and that will be shown tonight during the performance? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that pride is, the, is, the, is I'm, I'm, it's tough for me to say the peak of White Line. This is the album that breaks. Right. But this is the album, even though you were talking about fights, it's about fights as if I had, had a di different rhythm section. But Pride, the Pride album is when we are a band, is when we are the sound of White Line, is when we are unaffected of the industry, which means we go into the studio broke and have nothing but the band and the songs and the support of producer engineer Michael Wagner. So the band is, is committed and together and no distractions of anything. Two years later, when we go in to do the big game and following up a multi-million selling album and a, and a world tour with, with playing with, with, with supporting KISS, Aerosmith, ACDC, playing Japan, playing Europe, etc., etc. You know, we have sports cars, we have Harley Davidson's, we have money in the bank, and, and Vito and I have spent a week in a Palm Spring hotel room writing the album where the Pride album had been not just recorded once before and canned, it had also been our live set for at least a year and a half. So by the time you press record, we just played the song. When we went in to do the new album, it was just full of distractions. It was so many things that happened to the band. And the people we paid to be our guidance there were there, giving us the advice we needed. We, ne Vito and I, never needed any advice in songwriting. But you know what we needed? We needed to say, you know, you guys need half a year break. We basically came off the last month of November 1988, which the tour had started in the summer of 1987. We finished the last month playing together with Striper, and Vito and I had four days off after that tour when we got together and started writing the new album. Then we took a short Christmas break and then we came back to do, do pre-production. And I remember words from one of our managers or somebody else saying, you gotta get out there right away or else you're dead. So we sit there with this thing inside our head and you know, going into the studio with a bigger budget, with a, lots more freedom, etc., etc., etc. But just recording the album under completely different circumstances. Right. The hunger isn't there, you know. We take longer breaks, go to the Harley Davidson store, say I want to soup up the engine or whatever, you know, bullshit.